This is a passage of scripture that's it's just very real. It's very powerful when you stop and, and you think about what's happening. And it, it's really an amazing story. Mark chapter number five, and we've come to learn it as the maniac of Gadara. Uh, maybe you've heard it preached before. Maybe you know you yourself have taught it, maybe in a Sunday school or something like that, or or just done your own study on it. But it's a it's a passage of scripture that's that's very eye opening. It's, it's it's sad, but it's also very very amazing uh, what happens at the end of it. So we're just going to read one verse right now. We'll kind of go through you know off the passage as we, as we go through the sermon. But Mark chapter five. Let's read verse five for right now. Actually, we'll read five and six. It says, "And always." Night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I like to preach a message in this morning. When all hope is gone, help is on the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for your love to us. I thank you for this church and God, just the, uh, the encouragement that it is to me and my family and and Lord, I thank you for their faithful support, uh, Lord, not only financially, but I know through prayer, and Lord, just uh, uh, concern, and, and just, uh, Lord, just through a, a genuine uh, love, Lord, and I thank you for that. I pray, God, as we go throughout this sermon, that you be honored and glorified. God, I pray you help me. I pray you remove me uh, from, this, from this sermon, Lord. I pray that your word uh, will just challenge hearts, Lord, perhaps convict or encourage and Lord, we God, praise and glory for us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. My mother, when, when she was growing up, uh, she grew up in a home that if I could put it, put it kindly, it, it was just very unrestful. There just wasn't a lot of peace in her home. Uh, she grew up really not too far from here in Sandusky, Ohio. And uh, just really from a very, very young age, her home just kind of became that, that place of just unrest. You want your home to, to kind of be that place where after work and you, know, you shut the world out, it's just kind of that, ah, that moment, right? And for, for her, that just never was the case. And, and the reason being was because of my uncles. My uncles from a very young age uh, just got involved in the wrong things. They, they, they you know, kind of developed some wrong relationships and, and got involved in drugs and alcohol. And just that put a lot of burden on my, on my grandparents. My mom's parents, and so because of that, the home was just kind of a constant state of, of, of movement, of, of uh, fear, concern, and so it just really became kind of a burden. And really, in particular, it was my uncle Mark. My uncle Mark, from, a, from really the time of junior high, uh, just began to run with the wrong crowd. And like I said, drugs, alcohol. As he got into his adult years, he spent time in and out of jail. Uh, never really could kind of keep a good relationship with his own family, and just just really struggled in life. And he was kind of that person where where you just kind of you looked at Uncle Mark and he thought, man, he is just always going to be that guy. You know, it's, it's one step forward, two steps back. It's you know, wrong place at the wrong time. That that was just Uncle Mark. And, and really, as I began to kind of grow into a you know a young boy, I, I just kind of assumed that's how Uncle Mark was going to be for the rest of my life and certainly the rest of his life. And I'll never forget one particular morning. We weren't raised in a Christian home, and so the weekends were kind of a time where, you know, hey, it's a couple days off of work, and I can hang out with Dad, and we have fun, right? So I'll never forget it was, it was a Saturday morning, and my, my mom, or my, my, uh, my, the way my house was set up is that you would come down the, the steps of our home, and as soon as you would come out of the kind of the stairway there, you would make a right hand turn. And the moment you make that right hand turn, you're immediately into our living room. Well, then you kind of walk through a doorway kind of like that, and you walk into our dining room. And there'd be another doorway much like that, and you walk into our kitchen. So kind of just, you know, three consecutive rooms. I'll never forget it was Saturday morning, right? Saturday morning cartoons for a nine-year-old boy. That's, man, that's a great day. So I, I was coming down to get my cereal there, and as I was walking through the, the dining room, I noticed there was a man with his head down at my, at my dining room table, just kind of buried in his arm like this. I thought, man, that's kind of strange. You know, he wasn't there last night. And I went to bed. What's he doing at my table right now, right? You know, who is he? So it's, you know, as a nine-year-old boy, those thoughts kind of go through your head, and you think, well, mom and dad have to take care of him. I'm going to get my cereal. So 
I walked in and I got my cereal. I started pouring my Lucky Charms and, and pouring my milk there. And as I began to eat my cereal, probably that, maybe a minute or two had passed. And my dad had walked up from the basement and walked into the dining room. And as I was eating my cereal, all of a sudden I just heard this loud scream coming from the dining room. Man, what in the world is that? So I, you know, curiosity, right? I walked in the dining room and that man who had had his head down was now, was now looking up at the sky. He had his eyes closed. He was wincing in pain, kind of gritting his teeth. And, and he had his arm extended like this on the table. And I noticed as I was kind of taking all this in that his arm was just covered in blood, dried blood. And there was a, there was a bloody wash rag on the other side of his, of his arm there. And I mean, this is kind of a, a weird scene. What is, what is going on here? Well, as I was taking all this in, it dawned on me, wait a minute, that's, that's Uncle Mark. And to make a long story short, what happened was, is the night before, Uncle Mark had gone out and, and began to drink and became intoxicated. And, and somehow, some way, he got another person at the bar very upset with him. And they, they started to, to verbally fight, and eventually they started to physically fight out in the parking lot. And while they were fighting, this man must have evidently uh, pulled a knife on my Uncle Mark and went to, went to go stab him. Well, probably just out of reaction, or maybe just trying to you know, block the entrance of that knife, my Uncle Mark somehow, some way, blocked that knife, but he blocked it with the top of his hand. And so that, that blood drilling scream that I had heard was my, my dad was spraying an antibacterial spray in about a dime-sized hole in the top of my Uncle Mark's hand from that knife. And as a nine-year-old boy, as, I, as I'm taking all this in, you know, it's Saturday morning, I just going to watch cartoons, right? I, I mean, what's going on here? I just kind of looked at my Uncle Mark and just thought, man, this guy is just hopeless. He is just... He's just bad at life. He's just kind of broken. He's, he's going nowhere fast. And so as I walked up, you know, back up to bed and turned on the TV, I, I just, I kind of, I guess, made the, the decision that day in my head that Uncle Mark is always going to be that guy. He's always going to be that guy that just struggles with life, struggles to ever get ahead, and probably is just going to probably stay that way until... He's no longer alive. He's kind of broken, kind of, kind of messed up, if you will. And I believe in our passage of Scripture today, we find a man kind of like that. We find a man, for all intents and purposes, is pretty broken. He's, he's struggling with life. He's struggling uh, to really even have a relationship with society. He's, he's pretty hopeless. You say, well, what makes you say that, Greg? Look at verse number two. Number one, he's hopeless because of his isolation. Look at verse number two there. It says, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. I want you to notice the word there, immediately. In other words, the Bible's telling us that this man, as soon as Jesus, and you kind of take your, your mind there, kind of paint a picture, as soon as Jesus gets off of that boat, maybe ties it off to a stump or, or whatever he does, he steps on the dry ground, and immediately this guy meets him. In other words, there's, there's no waiting around. He's not, you know, peeking through a bush or, or looking behind a tree to see who it is. He's not asking one that anyone that's around him. He's, he's immediately being for Jesus Christ. No questions asked. He needs to get to this guy. You say, well, what, what would cause him to do that? What, why, would he, why would he not ask questions? Well, verse number three gets the answer. The Bible tells us that this man had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him. No, not with chains. So we find out that this man is, is not just passing through the cemetery one day on a, on, a, on a weekday stroll. He's living there. The Bible says he's dwelling there. That was his place of residence. That was the place he had come to know as home. And, 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 and that was the place where he was going to uh, essentially live out the rest of his life. You say, what in the world? What would, what would cause a guy to live, you know, in a cemetery? I know things get bad, but I don't know that lives at, you know, 324 Main Street, Euclid Cemetery. Yeah. Just, people don't do that. Yeah. Well, the Bible tells us, look at verse number 4. It says that because he'd often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So we're given this idea that 
that they try to bind this guy up. They try to, you know, perhaps maybe throw him in jail or get him, you know, in a, in a constrained situation. Yeah. And he'd break out of these chains. Break them asunder, break them into pieces, the Bible says. And you kind of get the sense that society just kind of said, listen, we are done with this crazy man. He is a lunatic. Just, just stay away from us. Don't bother us. We're not going to bother you. Just, just don't come down and, and, and mess with uh, our town, our city. You know, quit, quit causing havoc. Just stay away. And for whatever reason, he chose the cemetery, the tomb. The Bible says. Think about that for a moment. Think about being so isolated. No one ever comes by and just asks you how your day is. No one ever comes by to lend you a helping hand. No one there to, I don't know, cook you a nice meal one day, just because. This man was isolated and alone. There's been studies that have come out over the last, whatever it's been, two, two and a half years since, since COVID has been here. And, and the people who have been you know, isolated from family and friends, and, and they've been away from, from those they love, it's affected them mentally. Right. And emotionally. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's been a negative effect. Yeah. yeah. But folks, that's been a couple of years. <laughs> Imagine being this man where, where that's essentially all you've ever come to know him. We don't know when he was sent up there, but we know this, that he's been away from people and friends and family, if he had any, for a very long time. Because why would you run to see someone the moment you see him set off a boat? Last time I checked, I never ran to a stranger. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you have, I don't know, that's great. If you are, man, you're just people first. I guess I'm not. But this man was isolated. He was hurting. He was lonely. So not only was he hopeless because of his isolation, secondly, he was hopeless because of his condition. Look down at verse number five. The verse that we read, it says, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. I want you to focus on the first part of that verse. Always, night, and day. 24-7. That's all this man knew. Crying. Just emotionally broken. No doubt, probably from being lonely. Probably, maybe perhaps because of the pain he was feeling from cutting himself. But he's just emotionally spent. Day in, day out. Just crying and weeping and, and struggling with life. Depressed, no doubt. I'll be honest with you, there's been times in my life where I've gone through seasons of, of maybe just a valley or a trial in life, and, and I've gotten up and I've just cried for no reason. I've woken up and I just, man, what? I don't even know why I'm crying. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just hurting. I'm just crying. But by God's grace, He shows me something through His Word. He, he challenges me. He encourages me. He picks me back up. Amen. And I can move on with the Christian life. And, and praise God for that. that that's, that's love and grace. Praise the Lord for it. But for this man, that day never came. It was always night and day. A continuous cycle of brokenness. You know, there's been... One of the things that I've learned very quickly with my wife being pregnant, or when she was pregnant, is that sometimes her emotions get a little out of whack. Men, maybe you experience that with your wives having children. But over the life, you know, if you go back... I don't know, let's go back seven months ago. I was driving down the highway and I was going, I was going five over the speed limit. I look over and it's waterworks in the passenger seat. I'm thinking, what is going on? I do this all the time. Why are you crying? And she her response was, I don't know, I'm just pregnant. <laughs> well, that doesn't help me at all. What's going on here? But thankfully, now that Kate's here and, and those emotions are kind of getting back to normal, we're, we're kind of moving through some things. And that's good. Praise the Lord. But again, for this man, that, that day never came. It was just a constant state of sadness and brokenness and hopelessness, no doubt. And then on top of that, he's cutting himself day in, day out. Just hoping that maybe one day he finds the right nerve, he finds the right vein, and his life is over. No longer do you have to worry about the, the sadness, the brokenness, the, just the, the depression of life. He's just, he's just searching and longing for something. And no doubt he's he, living in the mountains and the tombs. He's, he's probably not getting three square meals a day. You know, so no doubt he's physically weak. 
And you know what happens when you're, when you're tired and you're hungry? Some of you get angry, all right? But, but think about it. For this man, it was, it was just a continual state like that. His condition was, was bad, physically, emotionally. So not only was he hopeless because of his isolation and because of his condition, thirdly today, he was hopeless because of his identification. Look down at verse number 9. Jesus Christ approaches this man. And he, he asks him really a, a very, very simple question to, to a grown man. He asks him what his name is in verse number 9. But notice the response that the man gives to Jesus at the end of verse 9. He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's kind of a, that's kind of a strange response. I, I told you earlier, I, I'm not too, if you were going to school, I'm not too good with second languages. I'm thankful that New Zealand is an English-speaking country. We were in uh, Georgia back in the fall. And there's a second language down there I'm not familiar with. And that's right here in our own country. And it's just, I'm just not good with second languages. And so, you say, man, what's going on here? What is, this is kind of a bizarre response to Jesus. And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, now one thing I've learned, although I'm not good with second languages, is when you're writing, grammatically, you want to keep things consistent in your writing. You know, first person with first person. You know, third person with third person. Singular pronouns with singular. You, know, you want to keep all that stuff in the right order. So, in this passage, or this verse, he starts off with my, or singular. My name is Legion. Then it says, for we are many. It switches to plural. So is this a mistake in the Bible? Well, well no. The Bible is showing us something very powerful here. Notice the word Legion is capitalized given a, a title, it's given a name. I haven't done a title study on it, but what I found is that the word legion was usually used to represent the largest portion of the Roman army. It was, it was a numerical value given to something. I've seen a number as low as 6,000, I've seen it as high as 20,000. Now you can, the number itself isn't what's important here, but it's a lot of something. We can agree on that. Yes. And so as Jesus Christ comes to this man, he says, my name is Legion, and it says, for we are many. So if you read the, the, the context of this passage, we won't for time's sake, but if you keep reading down, we find out that Jesus Christ is having a conversation with demons. This man is so overcome with a legion of demons. We find out, I believe it's in verse number 13, that there's about 2,000 swine that, that he sends the demons into out of this man, and they, they, they go towards the cliff there. So we know there's at least 2,000, or about 2,000, that have possessed this man. Right, right. Yeah. 2,000. Think about that. You're so overcome by, by demonic possession that you can't even answer Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, your own name. That they are doing the speaking for him. They have overcome him so much. They have, they have taken over his, his bodily function so much that he can't even speak without them first giving permission. He couldn't even identify who he was. Mm. Folks, this man was in a bad spot. Yes. He is broken. You could say he's going nowhere fast. Let's just say that. See, man, that seems, that seems pretty hopeless, pretty dark. Well, here's the best part. Go back to Mark chapter number 4. Maybe just a page or two back in your Bible. Mark chapter number 4. And look at verse number 35. <clears throat> Jesus has just finished giving the parable of the mustard seed. It's, it's becoming evening now. And he says at the end of verse 35, let us pass over, he tells the disciples, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. You say, why did, why did he turn there? Why did you have us read that passage? It doesn't seem, you know, too important. Folks, it's very important. Because here's the thing. Jesus Christ, in his omniscience, his all-knowing power, 
and his, his love and his mercy, he knew who was on the other side. He knew there was a man literally at death's door, broken, hopeless, and in desperate need of him. And Jesus Christ was going across the Sea of Galilee to reach this man. You say, well, what happened? Go back to Mark chapter 5. Well, I, I just kind of explain a little bit. He, he removes the swine, the swine uh, uh, flee there. And then look at verse number 15. It says, and they come to Jesus and see him and notice this, that was possessed with the devil. Now it's past tense. And I was this, and have the legion. The word legion is no longer capitalized. It's not given a title or a name of this man anymore. It's, it's no longer to have dominion over him. Sitting in clothes. You find it loose. The Gospel of Luke that he, he had no clothes. He ran around naked. Now he's clothed. And in his right mind. Remember just ten verses prior? He's, he's crying. He's cutting himself with stones. He's, he's suicidal. He's depressed. He's just emotionally distraught. And now he's in his right mind. And notice this, they were afraid. <laughs> that man, they were scared him before, right? They tried to bind him up in the chains and the fetters. And now they're still terrified when his life is radically changed by Jesus Christ. It's like, what, what are you going for, the poor guy? You say, what happened from there? Look down at verse number 20. After Jesus tells him to go and tell his friends what, what Christ had done in his life, he says, he departed and began to publish in the Catholics. How great thing Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. They just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Wait a minute. You're, you're the lunatic that was over Kadera, crazy man, but program on the chains and the feathers. That, that's you? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But what happened to you? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. And he, he told a multitude. It's amazing. You find in, in chapter 6, when Jesus Christ comes back through town, many people want to meet up with Jesus. They want to see him. They want to get to know him. I believe some of those people were a result of this man telling, telling what happened when he met Jesus. And they just marveled. They were just in awe of what Christ had done. I began this morning talking about my uncle Mark. Now he was kind of like this, just kind of that guy. Who just struggled. Well, about, it's probably been, I don't know, five or six years ago now. We were living in New Jersey, serving at a church there. And, and uh, every Sunday, my mom would call me between the two services. And she called me one particular Sunday, and, and uh, I picked up the phone, and I, it was like, you know, on Sunday, I said hello, and she said, Gregory? And when she said that, I thought, man, my full name, this is not good, right? I have trouble here. So I said, you know, when you say that, so I just said, Mom? You know, on the phone. And in the moment that I said, Mom, she just began to cry. And just really, really weak. It, it seemed like it lasted forever. It was probably, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. But after she had, you know, kind of contained herself and kind of came just calm, I just simply asked her, I said, Mom, what, what's going on? And all she could say was, it's your Uncle Mark. That's all she could tell me. And so I asked her, you know, what happened? Honestly, I was thinking to myself, you know, is he in jail? You know, is he, is he hurt? Is he even alive? You know, you just, you just didn't know with him. And she began to explain to me how about a month prior to that phone call, my uncle Mark had come to church. That was, that was kind of odd. He's never stepped foot in church before. It's very strange. My mom explained to me how he came to church, and, and as soon as the service ended, he was gone out the back door. Didn't even say hi to my mom and dad. So I was, you know, kind of weird, but somehow from, from that first visit to the time that I was talking to my mom on that particular Sunday, my pastor had met with my uncle Mark, you know, two or three times for lunch or, you know, a visit or whatnot. And that Sunday that my mom was now talking to me, he had come back to church. But this time it was really different. He came to church and, and he, he sat through the service and he, he, he waited around for everybody to leave this time. In fact, my mom told me that they actually left before Uncle Mark did. So this, man, what's going on? So as she began to explain it, she said, after everyone left, it was just my Uncle Mark and my pastor. And for about 30 minutes, my, my, my pastor relayed to my mom, 
Now, Melvin Mark just asked question after question after question about who knows what. It was just everything. And after about 30 minutes of asking questions, just kind of getting things understood, Uncle Mark got saved. And when she told me that, I'll be honest with you, I kind of just thought to myself, like, wait a minute, my Uncle Mark, like your brother, we're talking the same person here, is this real? Is this even happening? It's just Uncle Mark getting saved just was never, ever on my plane of thought. It's just, it's just mind boggling. And so we talked a little bit, I hung up the phone, and, and after I hung up the phone, I just kind of stood there in my apartment. And just kind of like verse number 20, I just, I just kind of marveled at the goodness of God. And how there's no soul that's too far gone. There's no life that can't be reached by the power of God. Amen. There's no person that's, that's too broken for Jesus. And folks, I'm very tired. There's people just like this all around us. They're right here in Euclid. They're right down the street in Cleveland. Uh, I stopped at the gas station this morning. I saw them on the way in. I, I saw them broken, and hurting from a night of regret the night previous. You know, it's no doubt that you folks are missions minded. You've been faithful supporting us. I, I, I see the prayer letter. I mean, I, I talked with your, your pastor and his wife. I just, no doubt you folks have a heart for missions. And praise God for that. It, it's incredible. Don't, don't ever change that. Keep, you know, keep increasing your faith. Keep giving the mission. Keep doing those things. God will bless that. But if all we ever do is just, you know, kind of give, give to a missionary and say, all right, missionary, you know, that's your job now. We're, we're cheering you on. Go across the sea. Woohoo! But yet, we never go across the street. I think we miss something. Because there's people there, too. You know that Euclid, Ohio is part of the world that God's commanded us to go into? Yes. Think about that for a moment. People right here that I'll never ever meet, I'll never get to see, I'll never have a relationship with, but, but God has placed you in their lives to, to potentially see them come to know Christ. May God help us to be diligent about getting out the message of hope that's found in this book to a lost and a dying and a broken world. You say, is Uncle Mark, you know, as man, is, he, is everything going great? I'm sure he's just, I'm fired for the Lord. No, he struggles, just like you and I. But you know, something tells me that this, this man in our passage today probably lived with, with the scars of his life before Christ for the rest of his life. He, always, he probably always had those reminders. He always had those, those struggles. Listen, you don't have to be perfect for Jesus Christ. Just tell someone about what he did for them. And let him change their life. And you'll be amazed. You'll marvel at what he can do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for your love to us. Lord, I pray that you help us. God, this week to be diligent about getting out uh, this message of hope. Lord, help us to be soul conscious of those that are around us. Of those that are in need of you. And Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless this church, continue, Lord, to uh, encourage them in you, continue to, uh, Lord, strengthen them, strengthen their pastor and his wife. And God, we've got to praise the Lord. For Christ's name we pray.